Psychology in Seattle. Hello and welcome to Psychology in Seattle. I'm your host, Kirk Honda, licensed therapist. Please visit psychologyinseattle.com, particularly go to our support us page. It'd be nice if you went there and learned how to support us and did one or more things to show your support from that page. You can email us at contact at psychologyinseattle.com. Also on our website, I've been adding links and other fun stuff, so check that out if you're interested. You can like us on Facebook. You can subscribe on iTunes. You can also review us on iTunes. You can comment on YouTube. This morning I read some strange and negative comments on YouTube. A lot of YouTube comments are negative, and I should stop reading them because they lower my self-esteem. Probably shouldn't do that. Today's music is provided by Bread Knife Incident, whose music is available on iTunes. And you can support us by telling others about us, particularly if they might be interested in this sort of thing. Today's episode is about love. It is Valentine's Day today, so of course, in a very pretentious and predictable manner, I am having a podcast on love. And more specifically, this episode is a book review of a book called A General Theory of Love, published in 2000 by Random House. Thomas Lewis, Faree Amini, and Richard Lannan wrote this book. They examined the phenomenon of love and attachment by synthesizing the previous separate fields of cognitive psychology, art, culture, um, neuroscience, um, and evolutionary biology. I would say that the book very easily sways back and forth from romantic sentiment to cutting-edge scientific research. The style of the book lies within... um, a happy medium between stagnant scientific journals and accessible self-help books. In this way, I believe the book would appeal to both academics and non-academics alike. The book uh, is tremendously popular. Evidence of this is that it has been translated into Spanish, Chinese, Japanese, Portuguese, Korean, Latvian, Croatian, and Farsi. And I had this book out on my coffee table and a client happened to see it there. And she said, oh, I read that book and I really loved it. When I picked up this book to read, I didn't realize that it was uh, as popular as it is. And, and, and after reading it, I guess I can see why it's popular. But I mean, it's a good book for sure. And it certainly appeals to someone like me. But I'm surprised that it appealed to a, a wide audience, I guess. Because larger audiences usually aren't interested in science. But after reading the book, I realized why it's interesting is because it because it's in this sweet spot between science and the sort of writing that appeals to larger audiences, if that makes any sense. So I'm just going to summarize the four main points of the book as far as I can tell. The four main points of the book are, one, our brains are affected by those closest to us, particularly during childhood. So the first main point is that our brains, our actual brains, are affected by those closest to us, you know, our parents, particularly in childhood. Our brains are affected by later relationships, but not as much as those relationships that we have in our early childhood. The second main point of the book is that within intimate relationships, our limbic systems synchronize with one another. There's a Throughout the book, the authors are writing about how our limbic system, which is a part of our brain, synchronizes with other people. And that through this synchronization, our lives are enhanced or certain needs are being met biologically. Um, I'll get more into that later. The, The third idea, the third main point of the book is the brain can be changed for the better through long term therapy. Uh, I suspect that these three psychiatrists are of the sort of therapists who enjoy long term therapy and see its benefit. One of the main points of the book is that long-term therapy can actually change the brain of the client for the better. The fourth and last main point of the book is that American society often frustrates our efforts to satisfy our biological need for connection. Um, Toward the end of the book, they talk about how there are certain cultural trends or cultural elements that frustrate our efforts our natural efforts to satisfy our biological need for limbic connection with other people and that these systems or these cultural elements get in the way of that and create a lot of the problems that we see. 
and I'll get into more of that later. So the authors begin by educating us in biological fundamentals, explaining the triune brain. The triune brain is a model of the brain and its evolution by a, an American physician and neuroscience, Paul McLean. Um, he has since passed away, I believe. Um, he formulated this model in the 60s, basically triune, three, three un. I don't know what un means, but um, three things, I guess, that comprise the brain. Um, first uh, is the reptilian brain with its basic functions of fight or flight, hunger, rudimentary movement. And then the second more evolved, so to speak, part of the brain is the limbic system with its emotional function. And this is seen in mammals, uh, according to this model. And then uh, the third part of the tri triune brain is the neocortical with its facility to reason. This is what is often referred to as, you know, what makes us human or um, the primates, uh, the neocortex is the, the most outer layer of the brain. Uh, it gives us our language ability, our executive function, our ability to plan into the future. It might even provide consciousness. There's a lot of research going in this idea, into, into this field. So the authors begin by educating us on the triune brain and explaining how evolution led to this illogically structured brain that each structure built upon the previous structure in an incremental way as a way of adapting to the environment and the needs of the animal. Um, as mammals needed to care for their young uh, because their young couldn't survive on their own, the limbic system was developed to motivate the parents to care and to love, so to speak, the child. But it wasn't like the limbic system was born out of nothing. It had to be built upon previous structures to some extent. For instance, you know, I say, you know, illogically structured because if we just designed a brain, we would say, okay, well, we need this section to be dedicated to X and this section to be dedicated to Y. But the brain isn't organized like that. So it, it, it's, it's confusing in terms of how it's structured, if that makes any sense. And I'm not a biologist, so this is, I'm a lay person when it comes to biology and the brain, as you will tell as I talk about this book. Um, so as ancestor animals adapted to their environment, each evolutionary solution was solved by modifying already established structures, including the nervous system. So not only did our hands evolve from, say, the fins of a fish, I'm pretty sure that's true, right? But our human brain evolved from a brain that was developing from, you know, reptiles to mammals and, and so on. So over the eons, evolution's twists and turns led to a quirkily designed brain. Structures of the brain evolved incrementally and without an, an end goal in mind. So it wasn't like some early ancestor animal was saying, we need to evolve into humans. That was not... There was no plan. It was just adapting very slowly to its environment and to its um, parent parenting needs and social needs. And over time, our brain just, you know, evolved. And, and I should say that the authors put this in much more elegant words. I think they're, they're adept at making the reader feel as though it all makes sense and it's easy to grasp. Um, I realize as I'm talking about it that I wouldn't be talking about this sort of stuff if the authors hadn't made me feel at ease with this material that is often intimidating to me and others outside of the field of biology. So I should point that out. And I, sh I should also point out that I read some literature on the triune brain, and there's a lot of criticism about the model, that it's overly simplistic and that its claims are not supported by more recent brain research. The idea that the brain can be split up into three distinct structures is challenged by more recent evidence. People often say, oh, you're left-brained or right-brained. Anyway, I won't go into that, but just know out there that 
the whole left brain, right brain thing is inaccurate. Now, if people are using it just as a metaphor, as a short-term way of describing personality or preferences, then fine. But um, if they actually mean that they're left-brained, as in being left-handed or something, then they're speaking from a myth that was propagated regarding the left-brain, right-brain personality thing. I don't know how to put it into words. Anyway, so then the authors take us further down the road toward love by describing the evolved functions of the brain structures involved in early relationships. Throughout the ages, instincts have evolved. For example, infants have an instinctual attraction to faces and a pre-programmed understanding of what particular facial expressions are linked with particular primary emotions. So they've conducted studies on newborns, and the evidence seems to show that newborns come with a template of understanding faces. So uh, a mother can look at a child with a scared face, uh, you know, a face that um, exhibits fear, and that children role will seem to understand that without ever having a contextual learning of that face being associated with fearful things, if that makes any sense. I mean, so it's the nature versus nurture thing. And some people would believe that uh, babies learn that our scared face is associated with scary things and then say, oh, that face equals scary things. But the research is actually showing that babies come out of the womb already understanding what a, what a scared face looks like or a happy face or an angry face. So these are instincts that have evolved and those instincts evolved within the brain. This multitude of innate brain structures encourages survival by establishing a bond between parent and child. So the child may be protected and taught by the parent. So in order for the child to survive, our brains evolved instincts to facilitate that survival. And understanding emotions in our parents is a definite advantage to survival, right? Not only in understanding danger and this sort of thing, but, but also in understanding attunement, how to attune relationally to one's caregivers. If the caregiver is happy and the baby reflects that happiness back, then the parent is encouraged to take care of that, of that child. Imagine having a child, an infant, that just didn't respond to you as a parent. And there are children like this. It can become very distressing to a parent and makes parenting much more difficult. It's harder to motivate. However, when you have a baby smiling and laughing at you, not laughing at you, but you know, laughing with you, it's impossible not to care for a child in a situation like that. So children having these instincts uh, developed instinctually in the brain prior to being born um, is, again, an advantage to survival and therefore would be selected for through evolution. So along these lines, research has found that a lack of nurturing love from a parent will damage the human brain forever. Um, the authors uh, briefly discuss some research regarding that, that if you don't love a child early in life, if you don't hold them, care for them, uh, attend to them, play with them, look at them, you know, all the things that you do with an infant, that the brain will actually show evidence of damage and that this damage will last forever, that it's not, you can't, it's difficult to repair it. I've certainly seen this uh, anecdotally in my clinical world. Uh, the, the, the most stark example of this is adopted children who come from extremely difficult early child situations. Um, say a child is born in another country where they don't have the resources or the systems in place to take care of infants that parents don't want or the parents have died. Um, they might put these children in institutions where there are some nurses who take care of the children but not enough to go around. And, and so the children are left alone in their crib a lot and not attended to. Now, they might get all their uh, nutritional needs. They might be kept warm. They might be kept comfortable. Their diapers might be changed. So they're not neglected in that way, but they're neglected emotionally. They're not held. They, they don't get to look into someone's eyes. They don't have a relationship with one particular caregiver over time. And even if they did, 
eventually they get adopted and they get taken away from that person and might not ever even see that person again. So all these emotionally neglecting experiences, in my experience, have led to adults or teenagers who are different than people who have had nurturing, loving experiences growing up in that they have a really hard time with relationships. So what I see in my practice are teenagers and adults who have a very difficult time attaching to other people and they have a difficult time reaching across and making the other person feel as though that they care about them. Now, it makes sense because they were not given that caring. And one way of looking at it is that they don't trust people. Well, another way of looking at it is that a certain portion of their brain has been damaged, so to speak, or is underdeveloped, and therefore it doesn't express itself in relationships. Um, according to this model proposed in this book, the, the limbic brain, the, the part of the brain that attunes to other people and needs to be attuned to other people, if this part of the brain is damaged because of early emotional neglect, then when that person interacts with other people, they're not going to have the same understanding or the same needs as other people are. And so when people who have, shall we say, normal limbic systems interact with people who have these damaged limbic systems, then they are going to experience a lot of difficulty and they're going to get their feelings hurt a lot and they're going to be confused a lot. So this book gave me additional understanding into that experience that I've seen a lot in my practice. All right. So then the authors continue by explaining that the brain is a network of neurons and that through chemistry, through neurotransmitters, neurons send signals to each other. By altering the chemistry of the brain, one can alter the functioning of the mind. Uh, for instance, caffeine can cause alertness. Um, SSRIs uh, can alleviate, like um, Prozac, can alleviate depression. Ritalin can increase focus and so on. So in theory, according to the authors of the book, all aspects of the mind are modulated by chemistry, including love. The authors briefly discuss the neurotransmitters involved in experiences of love. I wish they would have gone into this uh, more thoroughly. Um, I, I wasn't sure if the science just wasn't there when this book was written in 2000 or what, but I was left a little thirsty for this. But they point out that current biological investigations of love focus on three crucial chemicals in the brain, serotonin, opiates, and oxytocin. For instance, studies have found that oxytocin levels have been found to surge in human mothers around birth, which stimulates labor and also facilitates bonding between mother and the uh, newborn. So oxytocin seems to regulate not only the physical act of, of going into labor, but also the uh, feelings that a mother has toward their newborn. Also, uh, this wasn't mentioned in the book, but oxytocin has been associated with um, orgasm, the bonding feelings that one has uh, after orgasm. So this, this particular neurochemical, oxytocin, uh, in addition to opiates and serotonin, seem to be involved in the feelings of love and attachment. Um, another study uh, found that oxytocin gushes, so to speak, at puberty, which motivates crushes or romantic love, according to the authors. So there seems to be a, a, an increase in oxytocin in the brains of people while they're going through puberty. And the authors propose that this motivates crushes and romantic love that didn't exist prior to that. And we could say that that's generally true for most people that at the age of 10, they don't have a lot of crushes or romantic interest but as they hit puberty, 13, 14, 15, suddenly that's all they think about. Is oxytocin the, the main factor in that? I, I don't know if science today can answer that question, but um, it seems to be a place to look. The authors assert that these poems and songs describing the agony of romantic rejection are a result of evolution. Let me explain. So early animals evolved a mechanism to detect bodily damage. Um, you know, it all makes sense. Like if you have a, a lizard and or a fish and it is being attacked 
by something, it needs to know that so it can run away, right? So, so neurotransmitters evolved to um, give these animals the sensation of pain, right? Our ancestors, uh, there was, you know, some ancestor way back when that couldn't detect pain. And then one of our ancestors developed that ability to detect pain as uh, an early function of the nervous system. And since the body needs a way to restore balance, opiates evolved to assuage that pain. So you have systems in place to make one understand that there is damage to the body and that system involves feeling pain. And <clears throat> then there needs to be a way to turn off that pain feeling um, and uh, opiates are involved in that. As far as I understand, uh, I might be screwing that up. Uh, in terms of the biology, but from this book, that's what they're that's what they're saying. So when mammals evolved the limbic brain, the the mammalian brain, to facilitate the dependence on each other for survival, evolution recruited this primitive pain opiate system to motivate mammalian social behavior. So again, if one were to design the brain from the top down, we would say, okay, well, there's physical pain, which is something that is you know over here, and then there's social. Um, difficulties, which is different than that. And so there should be different neurochemicals or different processes involved in these um, because they're really not the same thing. I mean, there's, there's the feeling of having, you know, a sharp stick poked into your leg. And then there's, there's the experience of someone not liking you. These are very different, I would say, experiential things, but the brain doesn't know that. So this pain opiate system was adopted by the limbic system as a way to motivate social behavior. So when there was a, a social interaction that was counter to evolution, we evolved the tendency to feel pain in those situations, physical pain. And when things are going well, then we are rewarded with opiates. This is why relationships are described as both pleasurable, as feeling good, feeling warm, and also feeling painful and agonizing. As an example in the book, uh, most people say that there's nothing more painful than losing a loved one, uh, a broken heart. Um, these kinds of statements come from people's experience of what it feels like to be hurt uh, emotionally. And again, even the word hurt, uh, if you just said, I'm hurt, you wouldn't know if someone was talking about a bruise on their body or a bruise on their ego. Our language system uh, points to this connection between physical pain and emotional pain. And again, this understanding that the brain experiences emotional and social pain and pleasure in a similar way that it experiences physical pain and pleasure is important, I think. And as a particular poignant application of this theory, the authors attempt to explain cutting behaviors, behaviors that people will do when they cut themselves with, say, a razor, not as a suicidal gesture, but as a way of making themselves feel better in the face of extreme emotional difficulty. And I've worked with a lot of clients who, who do this. So the authors talk about how life is full of tiny and not so tiny rejections, a disagreement, an apathetic look, or even a breakup. These, these are tiny and not so tiny rejections. These social experiences of rejection produce emotional pain, which in some ways is in, indistinguishable from physical pain, as I talked about earlier. So say we have a, a teenage girl who is experiencing extreme emotional pain, ongoing pain, emotional pain, and hasn't found a way to alleviate that. She either hears about or just discovers on her own that when she cuts her skin, it makes her feel better in the end. And what happens is, is she's cutting her skin, pain fibers send pain signals to her brain. So at this point, her brain is processing both extreme emotional pain and um, somewhat transient physical pain. Uh, both of these pains are occurring. And eventually the brain releases pain's counterweight the soothing, numbing effects of opiates, right? So um, the brain says, um, Oh, I just experienced uh, physical pain. It seems to be over now. Uh, I'm going to release opiates to make the brain go back to normal. So it's not in this constant state of pain. Well, so in effect, 
this teenage girl caused a lesser physical pain of cutting herself to trick her nervous system into numbing a greater emotional pain. Because when the opiates are released in the brain, it not only numbs the pain of the physical pain of the cut, but it also alleviates the emotional pain too. Over the years, I've developed a satisfying formulation for why people cut, because it is an interesting behavior that can be confusing at first. But um, after working with people and reading and, and experiencing um, you know, ground level what it's like, I felt like I had a firm grasp. But after reading this in this book, I, I felt like, oh, I get it. So when they cut themselves, opiates are eventually released, which alleviate this emotional pain. I, I don't know if I understood how similar physical and emotional pain are to the brain. We have different constructions of those experiences, you know, one's physical and one's emotional, but the brain might not necessarily have that distinction, if that makes sense. And again, we're getting into some weird philosophical territory here because I just said that our mind might understand the difference between emotional and physical pain, but our brain doesn't. And of course, the mind exists in the brain. So that's a re totally ridiculous statement, but um, I hope you know what I mean by that. So then the authors dedicate a significant portion of the book describing research in cognitive psychology. Uh, the research that demonstrates that much of our motivations, memories, and processing occur outside of our awareness or control. So with this empirical foundation, the authors assert that the limbic brain, the mammalian brain, contains emotional attractors, with a capital A, attractors, encoded early in life. So I'll, let me go into that. Um, these limbic attractors compel bias when viewing emotions and relationships. Um, I'll, and again, this will make more sense in a bit, but um, uh, essentially what the book asserts is that through early relationships, we develop templates that we see the world through later in, in life, that these neural pathways that are developed in early childhood regarding attachment and love give us the foundation upon which we see ourselves and relationships later in life. So if, for instance, we early in life had a parent who was, you know, loving, but also critical, well, we might later in life be attracted to critical people. And that's a very rudimentary way of putting it, but that's basically what they're saying. And, and let me just kind of go off on a little tangent here for a second. <laughs> to some of you out there, you might say, hmm, that sounds a lot like what psychology has been talking about for over 100 years. And I would say you're right. Um, the authors of this book seem to be saying that they've discovered this fundamental aspect of humanness within neuroscience. And it's a bit dubious because neuroscience is in its infancy. Uh, I'm sure 100 years from now, they're... They're, they're going to say that we were at the very beginning of our understanding of the brain and therefore do not understand the brain very well at this point. So the authors seem to be taking this very simplistic understanding of the brain and making conclusions that are definitely within the academic and cultural world, that early relationships affect later relationships, and that if we have difficult childhood relationships, we tend to have difficult adult relationships, not always. So as I was reading the book, I was totally on the author's side and, and I was totally hooked. And then at the end of the book, I started thinking about it and I was like, well, wait a second. The entire book is basically a repackaging of psychodynamic theory and, and a lot of other psychological theories. It's just a repackaging of these theories within a evolutionary biology perspective. And, and for sure, it's wonderful that we can understand ourselves through biology and the brain. But the authors never reference this other field that has been going on for a long time and has a lot of established theory and research in it. They mention attachment. Um, but they don't mention Bowlby or Ainsworth or the countless other people who have written and conducted research in that area. And among a lot of other theories as well. I mean, psychodynamic to be specific, but, but at least attachment, because the whole book seems to support attachment theory. The book in, in a certain way could be seen as one of thousands of books that 
point toward this idea that uh, early attachments are important in the development of satisfactory lives or in the development of the way that we interact with people as adults. And if the book had acknowledged that, that they were part of a larger field, then academics like me would, I think, be satisfied. I mean, they, they could have kept the whole book exactly the same, but just thrown in every now and then, just briefly saying, um, and of course, Bowlby and Ainsworth and others have been looking into this, and so our, you know, this neurochemical research seems to support that. Um, if they would have done that, then I would, oh, okay, they're writing a popular book. They don't need to reference every single detail in there the way academics would, but at least they're acknowledging that they're writing within a larger field. Um, but the way the book comes across, they're writing as if they've invented this, that their science or their field of evolutionary, evolutionary biology or whatever field these psychiatrists consider themselves to be within have discovered this thing about attachment. And they call it something different. They don't call it attachment. They call it limbic attractors. I was reading some of the reviews on Amazon uh, and there are a lot of people who love this book and consider the book to be um, transformative to their lives. It helps them to understand each other, it helps them understand themselves, helps them to understand other people. But there was one review written by a psychologist who was saying exactly what I'm saying. And, you know, maybe it's just a fault of my industry's need to constantly cite everything and to reference everything. You know, maybe, maybe there's something weird about us, but it was a little bothersome. To, to say the least, honestly, because if I had written a book like this or even a paper like this and I didn't mention uh, Bowlby, actually, now that I think about it, I mean, these are professors in psychiatry. They know better. They, they have students that, who they talk about this with. I'm, I'm, I'm guessing, I'm only assuming that if one of their students wrote a paper like this and didn't reference attachment or psychodynamic theory, that they would fail um, the assignment because because you're not supposed to read a bunch of material on an eye on something and then reword everything and claim it your own um, that is a, akin to plagiarism essentially and so so anyway getting back to the review of the book so again one of the main points of the book is that through repeated experience with caregivers the brain becomes imprinted with what love feels like to the child. This collection of experiences or attractors and their neural consequences tell the child what relationships are, how they function, what to anticipate, and how to conduct them. If parents love children healthily, wherein mistakes are forgiven, children's needs are paramount, and hurts are soothed, then that is how the children will feel about themselves and relate to others later in life. All right, so it seems to me that the target audience of the book are people who have had troubled romantic relationships. And the authors are trying to explain why so many of us have dysfunctional relationship patterns. Um, this is a common pop psychology intention, is to help people understand why they have had dissatisfactory uh, romantic relationships. And, you know, by all means, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a um, worthy intention. A lot of people are suffering, and um, any way we can help, I think, is, is good. So if a child is not given steady limbic resonance, that child will have difficulty empathizing with others and managing relationships. Whereas if a child experiences a steady limbic connection with their parents, that child will develop the ability to empathize, to look inside someone else, and to respond accordingly. And when two healthy limbic systems join, limbic attunement allows these lovers to regulate each other's emotions um, and to regulate each other's neurophysiology. Their, um, they can regulate each other's hormonal status, their immune system, and other functions. I thought that this was a very interesting idea that not only does it feel good to be attached, but through that attachment, through that warmth, you're actually regulating people's neurophysiology, their hormones, their immune system and other functions. And certainly research is pointing in that direction that through relationships, our biology is enhanced. So the authors go on to assert that the human limbic system is stabilized through relatedness and through therapy. 
in the, sh- in the short term, when people are hurting and out of balance, they turn to others for support, right? Um, this returns them to homeostasis. Someone that had a bad day at work, they come home and they talk about it with their partner, and that person is returned to homeostasis, returns to stability. In the, in the long term, people can permanently fine-tune their limbic systems through prolonged contact with a caring, wise, responsive person who over time can bolster their healthy neural networks that will lead to increased self-soothing and relationship satisfaction. Many people leave therapy sessions, regardless of the theoretical orientation of the therapist, feeling calmer, stronger, safer, and often they don't know why. This uh, might be a result of limbic resonance, which is outside of conscious awareness. So through that limbic resonance with the therapist, the client leaves the therapy session feeling better, feeling more relaxed, more stable. So when a client comes in suffering from unfulfilling relationships or low self-esteem, through the attuned relationship with the therapist, the therapist is altering the microanatomy of the client's brain. So the authors assert that long-term relational therapy strengthens or weakens particular neural pathways. And the authors also assert that short-term self-help solutions are ineffective because they propose that a strong-willed client should be able to change how they think and feel. But it's not possible to will your brain to change its neural pathways. You have to experience that connection in order to change those pathways. Another way of putting it is that it took a limbic connection to create the problem and it will take a lived limbic connection to repair it. So, and I'll get to the critique of that in a second, but um, the authors end the book, basically end the book with a discussion of society. The authors make a compelling argument that American individualism, materialism, and capitalism are frustrating our emotional and physical health. For example, we disparage quote-unquote needy people, but we glorify self-made individuals. Since our culture promotes self-sufficiency, which leads to isolation, we suffer needlessly from anxiety, depression, narcissism, and other maladies of the 21st century. Um, I'm not so sure about this claim, honestly, but it it seems to make some sense, and and I can certainly get behind the, the meaning of it, but... Um, It gets difficult to say that today there are more anxious and more narcissistic people. Certainly, anecdotally, people could say that. But the authors advise that we should not only privilege our cortex cognitive mind, uh, but we should also pay attention to our limbic emotional selves. To this end, the authors advise that people should spend time together if they want to maintain their bond, even though our culture has yet to realize this. Because Americans are encouraged to achieve and not to attach. And therefore, this uh, denies us our need to bond limbically with other people. And therefore, all these maladies crop up like anxiety, depression, narcissism, and so on. The authors also talk about medicine and alternative medicine. They talk about how medicine has responded to external and internal economic pressures by paying less attention to patients' limbic system. The authors claim that American patients have deserted medicine for the warm embrace of practitioners who attend to patients' limbic system, like massage therapists, chiropractors, acupuncturists, and a host of others. Uh, The authors recommend uh, that medicine change their systems and practices to the way things were before, when kindly doctors spent time with their patients and attended to their limbic system health. This was an interesting idea. Certainly today, anecdotally, it seems to me that a lot of people do like their homeopathic doctors more. According to, to these psychiatrists, these MDs, they're saying that that's because medicine has responded to um, economic pressures to reduce the, prob- you know, probably to reduce the amount of time you spend with your patients. Whereas for whatever reason, homeopaths can spend more time with their patients. Now, I'll also say anecdotally that homeopaths don't make much money compared to medical doctors. Okay, so let me get into the critique a little more. I already critiqued some things, but um, one of the things that the authors did in the very beginning that I appreciated was they wisely admitted that even though love emanates from the physical brain and science provides a valuable tool for exploring the brain, 
human beings come equipped with an older means of discerning the nature of emotion, which is subjectivity. Um, you know, the way that we feel, how we describe things. You know, the authors are basically saying that we can't reduce the experience of love to neurochemistry, that we have always been able to describe things and investigate how love feels by not using the scientific method, so to speak, or by not looking toward biology to give us answers about what love is. So I enjoyed this caveat that they gave at the very beginning of the book. But from that point forward, there were some other problems. So let me critique some something here. The authors disparaged brief therapy or therapies that are brief as a universally unfortunate development since it denies clients need for long-term limbic attendance, right? So they, they think that short-term therapy is not so good because, or it's not going to be effective because it doesn't allow for limbic resonance between the client and therapist that needs to occur over time. As a relational therapist myself, I certainly agree with the author's assertion that some therapeutic goals are best met through an ongoing attuned therapeutic relationship. In support of this idea, there is a growing body of empirical evidence supporting the efficacy of long-term psychodynamic therapy. Uh, there's a study by Town and, and other authors uh, from 2012, if you wish to look that up. However, many of my clients also come to therapy for issues that are not suited for long-term therapies. Some client goals are best met in short-term therapy. So if the authors had had that caveat that when they are disparaging brief therapy, they are talking about a particular slice of the pie regarding clients' goals, then I would have been okay if they would have said, you know, when a client comes in talking about low self-esteem related to their early childhood experiences, I can't treat them in five sessions. That client needs to be in therapy for a lot longer than that. And insurance companies should understand that and pay for that. I certainly would get on board with that, but to just say blanketly that short-term therapy is a bad thing is, um, is inaccurate in, in my view and is out of touch with the fact that clients come into therapy for all sorts of reasons. For instance, let's say someone comes into therapy because their, their mother died and they're coping okay, but they, they want five, 10 sessions to, to just talk about their mom and talk about their struggles and they want to explore what this means to them and, and where they're going to go with their life. That might not be something that necessarily warrants, uh, you know, 50, 100 sessions. It, uh, five, 10 sessions might be sufficient. Now, is a deep therapeutic relationship going to occur in five sessions? You know, not, not likely, but it, it can. Honestly, I, I've experienced with clients a deep emotional connection within 15 minutes of the first session. Connections aren't established by the amount of minutes you spend with someone. It's, it's established by the way that you come together and that, that way you come together can, can create connections very quickly. So the last critique that I'll provide is, is the following. After a somewhat long, circuitous discussion regarding cognitive research findings, the authors arrive at one of their main concepts, the limbic attractors, as I mentioned earlier. Again, limbic, limbic attractors are biases developed early in life that affect one's view of adult relationships. And to those of you in my field, that should sound very familiar, right? Um, and it's, but they call it limbic attractors. So again, they don't, ref they don't reference Bowlby or Ainsworth or the countless other authors and theorists who have come up with the exact same idea. But anyway, um, until they actually did, which was the authors mention that Freud's concept of transference is similar to their concept of limbic attractors. This exhibits responsible writing, right? So that when, the, when I came across this, I was like, oh, finally, they're making a connection to previous theorists and the previous writers. And they, they were referencing that Freud's idea of transference was, was similar to their idea of limbic attractors. However, in the next paragraph, they write, quote, science has a way of supplanting myths with no less fantastic truths. So the key words here are myths and truths. They're saying that transference is a myth while attractors is a truth. They literally are using myth and truth. So again, quote, science has a way of supplanting myths with no less fantastic truths. The words myth and truth are very 
powerful, right? A myth is something that's not true, right? It's something that is made up, right? Truth is, is truth. It is what it is. The earth revolves around the sun. That is truth. Uh, to say that limbic attractors is truth and transference is myth is quite a statement and quite telling to the philosophy of the writers, honestly. Now, if they had gone into a long discussion, a longer discussion of Freud and all the people in between Freud and today, because, you know, Freud was just one person in a long string of theorists and writers that, you know, bring us up to the present, whom have written about this sort of thing, this idea that biases are developed early in life that affect one's view of adult relationships. But again, perhaps the authors did not want to bore the lay audience with research and jargon, or perhaps the authors wanted to make it seem as though they were truly inventing a new general theory of love. Again, that's the name of the book, A General Theory of Love. Uh, I wrote them and really complimented it a great deal because this is right after I had read the book. But I asked them about this idea of, of why they didn't talk more about Bowlby and Ainsworth and all the others. And, and I thought I would get a reply, something on, along the lines of, well, you know, we, this was written for a lay audience and we didn't want to bore them. And if we were writing an academic publication, then we would have done that, certainly. And here are some articles that I wrote that, ju that do that very thing. Um, then I would have been okay. I would have been like, oh, okay, it makes sense to me. Um, but they didn't reply, so I, I don't know. Um, what their answer would be, or they haven't written me back yet as, as of this podcast. So in conclusion, again, I'll say that this book added to my understanding of attachment. Um, it has illuminated connections that I hadn't seen previously. For example, the piece of the puzzle regarding the cutting behaviors, it, it you know, this book added to my formulation regarding that. Um, this book has also bolstered and inspired my efforts to foster more love in the world. After reading this book, I found myself focusing more attention on my clients' limbic selves, so to speak. You know, I'm, I'm thinking, are they getting enough love in their lives? Are they, get, are they cuddling enough with people? Uh, um, how much time are they spending connecting with other people? It's one thing to say you love someone. It's, it's, it's one thing to intellectually know that the other person cares about you. It's another thing to actually sit down and listen to someone for a long period of time, to cuddle with them, to feel them. That, I'm guessing, has an effect on the physiology of the brain. And that, that those effects have profound effects on one's overall functioning and one's overall happiness and mood and, and, and everything. And the feeling of connection between the two people. You know, it's, it's, again, it's one thing to say, I want to spend the rest of my life with you. It's another thing to have it be a felt experience that, that you have in the moment with that person and, and over, you know, over long periods of time. And I've always known this, but this book gave me yet another reason to emphasize it. And I found myself emphasizing it a little bit more with my clients um, while I was reading this book. So again, I mentioned the reviews on Amazon.com. Uh, and a lot of the um, people who read this book loved it. And it wasn't just an interesting book to them. It was actually life-changing for a lot of people. So for that reason, uh, regardless of the critique and the shortcomings, I would say that this book has a lot of value to people. To us academics and clinicians, we read this and say, hey, where are the references? But if this book helps people, then in, in my mind, it's, it's a good thing, regardless of the shortcomings. For instance, uh, a lot of people were writing on Amazon.com that, that um, I don't know why I keep saying Amazon.com. I mean, if I, if I just say Amazon, I'm sure you know what I mean, right? I guess I could say uh, a lot of the reviews on HTTP colon uh, backslash backslash Amazon.com slash, you know, anyway, just joking. Um, <clears throat> where, where, where was I? Oh, a lot of the reviews on Amazon were by people saying that this helped them to forgive themselves for having such difficult relationships in their history, that this book helped them understand why they had so many difficult relationships romantically. Because the book, you know, one of its main points is that if you grew up with difficult relationships with your parents, then that will influence you to be attracted to 
those elements in romantic relationships. And it's unconscious. It's not something that you do consciously and that it's wired in your brain. And the book also provides an answer to it that it's not saying, well, you're wired that way. You're screwed. It's saying through therapy, you can change this through long-term relational therapy. You can change this. And I can certainly get behind that idea personally, you know, clinically me, I can get behind that idea. And, and that really made sense to a lot of people. So in that way, again, I can say this book has a lot of value. All right. Well, I kind of meandered around and I have no idea if that made any sense. Um, and as usual, when I do podcasts by myself, I get a little worried that I'm boring the crap out of people or that um, it's not what you guys want. So, so let me know if, if this sort of thing uh, appeals to you because um, I can certainly do either. I can, I can do podcasts like this and or I can do podcasts with Berto and Mandy. So again, this book is called A General Theory of Love published in 2000 by Random House, written by Th- Thomas Lewis, Faree Amini, and Richard Lennon, who are psychiatry professors at the University of California, San Francisco. Um, what else should I say? Um, if you've listened this long, you, you must like the podcast, kind of. So if you don't mind, it would be nice if you left some comments, because when I'm recording these podcasts, I'm motivated by the notion that people are listening. But of course, right now I'm alone in a room. No one's listening. You know, my cats are listening. So, um, and you know, they almost never give me positive feedback. And so what motivates me to do this is feedback from you. You know, if we were in a big room together and there were, you know, however many of you in the audience there would be, I would see your faces and you might even clap at the end of it and that would make it all worth it. But of course, when I press stop on the recorder, that's just it. You know, I go to the bathroom and have a cup of coffee and then I go on with my day and it's like, I've, you know, there's no feedback. So if you could provide some feedback, that would be great. I know this makes me sound like an insecure desperate person. And so be it. I, I guess that's me. Attuned to my limbic system here, people. Going back to the to the book, if, if we were in a room together and we were going back and forth and you were talking and I was talking and we were smiling at each other and we were, you know, giving each other compliments like, oh, I like that idea. That makes sense to me. Then our limbic systems would be attuned and would give us that good feeling and would motivate me to continue to do this. But of course, I'm just staring at my computer right now. And my computer doesn't give me a lot of uh, warm feelings, believe it or not. So I don't know, it'd just be nice. And and to those of you who have provided positive feedback and have, you know, sent me a short note, you know, those things are wonderful. And and they do uh, keep keep me going. Wow, I'm sure that came across as massively desperate. (laughs) If you want something, you might as well ask for it. So All right, that does it for another episode of Psychology in Seattle. Uh, Thanks for listening, and please take care of yourself, honestly. Take care of yourself. Think about how you're feeling. Think about how you're doing. Are you you too stressed out? You know, pay attention to yourself. Um, I, I find that a lot of people suffer because they're just not paying attention to their own suffering and don't put efforts to alleviate that suffering. So, um, so take care of yourself. I mean it. Okay. Have a good day. See ya.